Negative feedback, that's where we're gonna start here with our homeostasis series. Negative feedback is the mechanism that maintains homeostasis. I'll contrast this to positive feedback in the next lecture. They are, they're similar and that they're both feedback loops, but negative feedback is what we're going to use, our bodies use to maintain homeostasis. So if we wanna have a variable, a regulated variable maintained within some range, what do we need to do to do that? We need to be able to, one, detect a change. So we need some, a sensor to be able to say, oh, glucose is too high. Oh, temperature is too low. Oh, pH is too high, whatever it is. Then we need something to be able to decide, determine, like detect, but then, okay, compare to the set point. So that's like a control center that decides whether that detected level is different than what it should be. What else do we need? Something to respond. So a um, effector is what that's called in biology. Um, something to cause an effect. So, okay, let's change the temperature. Let's change the glucose levels. Um, that's the three basic components, but we're gonna get into more detail than that. Let me share my screen with you on negative feedback. So what I wanna do is actually have you start by trying to make sense of this yourself. So I want you to design a system that keeps water temperature in an aquarium warm. So your stimulus is going to be low temperature. Let me get my laser pointer here. Okay, so um, you're gonna draw boxes. This is gonna be a flow diagram. You're gonna be drawing these for feedback loops often in this class seven components of this diagram of the system. Low temperature is your stimulus. That is what you need to address. You've got an aquarium with some fish in it. They are tropical fish and they're too cold. Um, so you need to find a way to have your aquarium measure that temperature and warm it up when it needs to. Um, so the different components I've given to you here, stimulus, Sensor, control center is the same as an integrator, that's the decision maker. And then your effector, you'll also see that called the target because it's like the target organ or thing that is affected, um, that's gonna do something. The target of the loop. I actually, I like effector better. Um, those are the four that I mentioned before, I believe. Three, but yeah, I mentioned sensor, control center, target. You then need to have a response. And then the other two are input signal and output signal. You'll see this, these are somewhat variable in terms of how, how the loops, when you see these drawn out, whether those are labeled. Um, that's basically gonna be input to the integrating center and output from the integrating center. If you wanna skip those for now, that's fine. What I want you to do is pause the video and try as best as you can to draw out the mechanics, right? This is a engineering problem um, to maintain water temperature. Please pause. Okay. Here's what I drew. I didn't draw this. I'm a liar. So this has, um, you can look at this either by the picture or this is what I asked you to do. So you should have something like this. Um, this is a description for each one. I'm gonna go through them kind of together. So here, water temperature is below the set point. That's our stimulus, low temperature. Um, that's shown here in, in the aquarium itself. We need something to detect that. A sensor, you'll see it called receptor sometimes. In this case, that's a thermometer. You know that thing, right? Um, thermometer is going to detect that decrease. Here's a thermometer actually in the aquarium. And that's going, there's a wire that's gonna detect, um, transmit that information from the sensor to the integrating center. It's a, it's a signal. In our bodies, it's gonna be a nervous or endocrine system typically. That's our input signal. And you will see these diagrams drawn without the input and output signal sometimes. Um, they are really important, so I want to include them from the from the get-go. Then we've got this integrating center or control center where it's gonna decide whether to respond. 
So here's the control box of the aquarium. If the temperature is below 29 degrees, it's designed to turn on to um, tell the system to do something. In this case, what that is, the output signal is going to, um, in this case, it's just, it's just right here, um, going to tell the target, which is the heater, to turn on. Okay, temperature's low, turn the heat on. That's our target or effector. It's going to have an effect, it's going to create a response, which is increase in water temperature. That increase in water temperature causes the loop to turn off. That is negative feedback. The response counteracts the stimulus. Notice that a low temperature results in an increase in temperature, which then turns off the system. So the increase in temperature means there's no more stimulus. This is a negative feedback loop, even though water temperature increased. The negative just refers to turning the loop off, not at all the direction that the response is in. And that's a thing that I've seen students get tricked up on before. Doesn't matter what direction this response is, if it's an increase in temperature or decrease in temperature. Increase in glucose, decrease in glucose. Increase in sodium, decrease in sodium. It's a negative feedback loop because it turns off the system. So, Hopefully that was helpful. Here's a diagram from your book that's a little bit simpler. Um, I think it's also, it's also nice. So this is the thermostat example here up top. Um, the room temperature falls, thermostat activates, tells the heat to go on, temperature rises. Here's our negative feedback. Turn, the thermostat turns off the furnace. Um, and then this is going to, if the room cools too much, it's going to turn on again. In terms of the body, and going back to what I showed in that previous video with the oscillations, this is what it looks like in terms of what's happening with those oscillations. This is why those oscillations happen. Because we can't, it's not a steady state, it's dynamic. So core body temperature is on the y-axis. Um, 37 degrees Celsius is our set point but it's just not quite at that ever. So you have a slight increase because you're just living, you're alive, you're producing heat. Um, you start sweating and by temperature cools. As it cools, you start shivering. Those are actually fairly extreme. Before that, another thing that happens, I don't have these as key terms yet, we'll come back to them at some point, but it's a dilation, is the dilation opening of your um, blood vessels that helps to cool you off something that happens with the autonomic nervous system, so it happens automatically. You don't have to think about it. Vasoconstriction happens when you get cold. Um, also, like blood shunting to the core, so your hands, why your hands get cold. And here's a cat. So that, again, is seeing those oscillations around the set point. Another way to look at feedback loops that some people find really useful is this teeter-totter thing. So this teeter-totter is showing the balance. And when there's imbalance, a feedback loop is going to turn on. So the, temp the example we just had was a cold stimulus. When imbalance, slight imbalance occurs, you're too cold, that's going to cause these special receptors to turn on or sensors, tell the control center to do something. Um, the control center for humans is typically either the endocrine or nervous system. In this case, case, brain, so nervous system, is going to tell the skeletal muscles to start shivering. Skeletal muscles are the effectors or target, and the response is body temperature rising. The rise in body temperature turns off the stimulus. It's no longer cold, that was the stimulus, so it's negative feedback. In the other direction, with body temperature rises, we've got these temperature-sensitive cells are gonna respond, brain's going to decide. In this case, it's going to tell sweat glands to kick in. Let's start sweating. Evaporative cooling occurs and cools down the body. Both of these loops are negative feedback, whether we have an increase in body temperature or a decrease in body temperature. So, 
So the generic version of this teeter-totter, I don't typically draw the teeter-totter. I'm going to have you draw out those diagrams. For some people, they really liked like this to help conceptualize it. So I like actually let's put those together. Here is a generic teeter-totter that has all those terms I had you list before. So we've got our stimulus, our receptor, our input signal, our control center, the numbers, I don't know why that one's not numbered, the output, the effector, and the response. So that's actually seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven parts that correspond to the seven parts you drew for the fish tank. Um, and these definitions are the same as what we've already talked about, right? Um, so again, I won't typically draw this teeter-totter, but I will have you draw out those seven components here. Okay, what we've done here is one, define negative feedback, give an example of it, and explain its importance to homeostasis. And two, explain the components involved in negative feedback. So what are the components and describe each component, what's the role of each of those, um, and th that act to maintain homeostasis and provide an example of negative feedback in the body.